Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word, for the reading and the hearing of your word, even the opportunity to preach. I ask, O oh Lord, that you teach our hearts, O oh Lord, and um, help us to uh, that we'll, our lives will not remain the same, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, look at verse 11 there, Ezra chapter 3, Ezra chapter 3, verse 11. The Bible says, And they sang together by chorus in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord, because He is good, and for His mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites, and chief of the fathers, who were ancient men that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people, for the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. The title of my sermon this morning is Understanding More Than the Ancients. Understanding More Than the Ancients. Now, let me catch you up with the story of Ezra. Let me catch you up to chapter 3 there. The beginning of Ezra starts off, Cyrus the king of Persia proclaimed liberty to Judah, or to the cap captives of Judah, and um, he asked them to go and build a house of the Lord in Jerusalem. So God stirred up his spirit, and God also stirred up the spirit of the people of the captives, those that their spirit was stirred up, according to what the Word of God says, moved, uh, or decided to move over to Judah to build the house of the Lord. So this was fulfilling prophecies that Jeremiah prophesied, that Isaiah prophesied, and many other prophets. And it's similar to the Exodus, but without the plagues, obviously. So, it's similar to the Exodus, how God saved Israel, or got them out from bondage or from captivity. So, the Jews that went, they left with precious things of their neighbors. You know, similar to Exodus, they took the precious things of their neighbors and they went with it. On top of that, uh, Cyrus gave them a lot of wealth, a lot of everything they needed, basically, and more, according to the, you know, how God stirred up his spirit. So, he gave them also the vessels of the temple of God. So, the vessels that Nebuchadnezzar kept in his God's temples, he, gave it, uh, he took those vessels and gave them to the Israelites or the Jews so that they can go and build the house of the Lord and put those vessels back there. Now, Zerubbabel was their leader. I mean, he was their king of sorts, I should say, but they were still all on that. They were now a province, no, no more a nation, if you, if you understand what I mean. Uh, so, he was their leader, and and this is according to the word of God that because Zerubbabel is a descendant of David. So open to Jeremiah chapter 33, Jeremiah 33, verse 14. So he's a descendant of David. And when he came out of captivity, Zerubbabel was still uh, was their leader, a descendant of David. So God kept his promise according to Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 14. Behold, the days come, said the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, when Will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days shall Judah be saved, and, Israel, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. Verse 17. For thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. Neither shall the priests and Levites want a man before me to offer burnt offerings, and to kindle meat offerings, and to do sacrifice continually. So we know this is pointing to us Jesus, but there's a dual fulfillment here. There's a present, there's a near future and a far away future. So it's talking about Jesus here. It's very easy to see that because again, the title of this is we have uh, understanding more than the ancients. We have more understanding now because more has been revealed to us. But let me not go ahead of myself. So Jesus is the king. He's a branch. He's a branch of righteousness, a branch of, from David, and he is the high priest at the same time. So God says, uh, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel, neither shall the priest, the Levites, want a man before me to offer burnt offerings and to kindle meat offerings and to do sacrifice continually. So although they went into captivity, a line of David remained and a line from the priest and the, and the Levites, they remained. That was Jeshua, son of Josadak. He was the high priest, while Zerubbabel was the king. And his brethren, the priests, were with him. So Ezra also was a scribe, which is a priest. He was a scribe in the law of Moses. That means he copies the law. He keeps history up to date uh, uh, for the land of Israel according to the laws of God. So Ezra was a priest and a Levite, a descendant of Aaron himself. You can find that in chapter 7 in Ezra. 
So he was keeping the laws and histories. And it was a very important position uh, who, what Ezra was fulfilling. He wasn't just a glorified you know, copying machine or something. He was, I mean, he reads the Bible, uh, the laws of God, and he teaches them and he keeps the law, he keeps the history, the kings. I think he was one of them that wrote the Chronicles. So it was a very important position for Ezra because God promised to preserve his word and that is by writing. All right, now we get to Ezra chapter 3. In chapter 2, it was just a list of the numbers of people that left to build the house of the Lord. Now, in Ezra chapter 3, Israel did not wait to start building the temple. They went straight into the sacrifices. They started offering sacrifices. Why? They were afraid of the countries that were around them. Not necessarily that they were afraid of those countries themselves, but they were afraid of God. You know, God rescued them miraculously. I mean, the king just decided, hey, you guys go back, take everything you want. So they knew it was God, no doubt. So God rescued them miraculously, and they were afraid to not offer sacrifices. They were afraid to break any law of the Lord. So immediately they got there, they started offering the sacrifices because they didn't want to go into captivity anymore. The daily sacrifice, the burnt offerings, the new moon offerings, the feast offerings, free will offerings. I mean... Are you too happy about the New Testament, the New Covenant? <laughs> we don't have to do all these sacrifices. This place will be smelling like... I don't even know what this place will be smelling like. I'll be like, man, I'm not a Levite, so... <laughs> I'm not doing this. <laughs> anyway. Uh, but yeah, they offered all those sacrifices. They couldn't wait. And they continued this for a whole year. So they did this for a year. But now the second year rolled in, and they decided we're going to build the temple of the Lord uh, so we can do everything the right way, how God would want us to have it. In fact, that's why we were sent here, to build the temple of the Lord. So uh, they were building the temple in the place where it originally stood. In fact, the sacrifices, because you have the big uh, sacrifice in front of the temple, like you climb up the steps, if you know the description, but you climb up the steps in the courts, then you have that brazen uh, bowl. Then you have the main sacrifice that is daily offerings. So that's where people go and offer the sacrifice. At that base there, that's where they, uh, they were offering the sacrifices. They didn't take it to anywhere else in the original place where the sacrifice was. And they, now they decided to lay the foundations of the temple because the temple was broken down and crumbled. It was a desolate place. So they laid the foundations of the temple and uh, it was desolate for 70 years. Why was it desolate for 70 years? That was what God proclaimed. Uh, that was a prophecy from Jeremiah that because of 490 years of abandoning or not doing the Sabbath, you know, leaving the land to Sabbath. This land has to, there should be a Sabbath for the land every seven years. So Israel ignored that. Why? Because of greed, covetousness. I mean, why you just leave your land there when you could plant and have fruits so that you can sell it and make money? And they didn't trust in the word of God that the harvest of the sixth year would be enough for two years. Even if they did trust that God, they still wanted more. So it, they were not satisfied. It's either greed or greed and not trusting the word of God. Anyway, God will get what he's owed. Understand that. You cannot steal from God. God will always get what he's owed. And he got it back from them. 70 years. Those 70 years are the years of Sabbath. And the land lay desolate. All right, that's a summary for another day anyway. I'm just showing you. So, why I'm pointing it out? Because it was just 70 years that God said they would be in captivity. And Daniel started praying and, you know, God showed up with Cyrus, uh, uh, saying, proclaiming what he proclaimed. And there were people that were alive, young kids at the time, maybe 10 years old or 15 years old or even 20 years old, that were alive that during, uh, before the captivity and lived through the captivity <laughs> and, was, and still survived and came over uh, to Israel, to, be, or to Judah, Jerusalem, to build the temple. They were one of those people. Those people were called the ancient men. You can see that in Ezra chapter 3, verse 12, what we just read. But many of the priests and the leaders and the chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house so they saw the, the house there is the house of the Lord they saw the temple how it was the glorious Solomon's temple how worship was being done there and everything and the building itself that's in the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes they wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy so the young ones that didn't see the first house, they were rejoicing. Oh, yeah, 
we have this temple back. We're building our temple. We're free now. We can worship God how, you know, the ancients and our teachers have been teaching us. You know, the songs that they sang. Because we didn't see all these things. Imagine growing up and they're telling you, oh, you know, where we came from. You know, we had freedom. We had this. We had that. And they're here slaving in Babylon. Uh, so, or in the, in the uh, kingdom of Persia. So they were slaving there. And so they're so happy to be free. They're so happy to be able to worship God how they were th uh, taught to worship God. While the ancient men were weeping. Because this house was nothing compared to, th that's the house they set up building was nothing compared to the, the former house, the first house, Solomon's temple. Just by looking at the foundation alone. Just how they laid the foundation, the, the uh, things going on around the time. They were like, this is nothing compared. And I believe it's, it's more than just the building. I believe it's the times that they were living in. You know, they look, and the Bible says you shouldn't do this. Don't look back in the former times and say, oh, wow, the former day is better than these days, right? So, but they look back at the former times and they're like, look at how we're building this house compared to when Solomon's temple was built. And look at the times we're living in when we're worshiping God in fear instead of just, you know, worshiping God uh, without being afraid of the neighbors trying to uh, take us captive or anything. So they wept when they saw it. And that was not weeping of joy. It was weeping for, <laughs> of, it's, we, we've fallen so far. I mean, the days have gone so bad. And those, that's what the ancient men thought. And were they wrong to think that way? Were they, was the assessment wrong? Uh, the answer is no, they were not wrong. God confirmed that what they saw and what they, uh, they, they assessed was correct. Uh, open to Haggai, Haggai chapter 2. Haggai is in between the two Z's. That is Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah. All right, so Haggai chapter 2. Open to Haggai chapter 2. I'm going to read from verse 1. Now, there was something missing that they missed, though. That's the ancient men, they missed something, but they were right in the assessment. From what they saw, the foundations were laid, the times they were living in, the building itself, it was nothing compared to the glories of the first house, but they missed something clearly. And that's why we have more understanding than the ancients. Okay? All right. Haggai chapter 2, I read from verse 1. The Bible says, In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shatiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory, and how do ye see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of, sorry, is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? So what is God saying here? By the way, Haggai is a prophet during the days of Zerubbabel, as you can see. So understanding the times. All right. So what God is saying here is, that where are the ancient men? Who are the people here that saw the first house? Now look at the people that are seeing this house as we're building this house. How do you see it? Is it not in comparison as nothing? I mean, this house cannot hold a candle to the first house, right? It, it should just blow it away. That's what I mean. Like it's in comparison as nothing. So God gave the right assessment. Or God is affirming that they gave the right assessment. And he's telling them, see, this house is not cannot be compared to the first house, right? Verse 4, he, God goes on to say, Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, said the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, said the Lord, and work. For I am with you, said the Lord of hosts. Yes, the house is not the same, but remember, you still have God. God never changes. If it is God that did the first one, he can do it again. And he can even do it better. Job will tell you that, right? And don't say, oh, the times have passed. Oh, I, 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 um, my, my time, my prime is over. No, God can do it again. Time is not a factor for God. So God is reminding them that I am with you. Be strong. Just do what I have told you to do. That's to build a house. Because they were afraid to build a house because of letters. That's another story. So let's keep going. Verse 5. According to the word that I have covenanted with you when ye came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. For thus said the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, said the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, said the Lord of hosts. The glory 
of this latter house shall be greater than the former, said the Lord of hosts. In this place I will give peace, said the Lord of hosts. So God clearly is telling them here that yes, this house is in comparison to nothing compared to the first one, right? But the glory of this latter house will be greater than the glory of the former. So the ancient men assessed it correctly, but there's more understanding. There's more revelation in the word of God. God was telling them, hey, I'll, I'll shake the heavens and I'll shake the earth. All the nations, the desire of nations uh, will come and I will fill this house with glory. That means people are going to come to this temple. Everyone is going to come and know God and worship God in this temple from all nations. And money is not a problem. Silver, the gold is mine. I'll build this house for you. Just do what I tell you to do. So money is not a problem. The problem is, are you willing and do you believe? Because they were, they were uh, on crossroads here. They were trying to make up their minds. Should we continue with this house? Or should we fear because the king said we should not build a house? That's, this was another king that took over at the time when they were building. So the king said we should not build a house. So God is telling them through the prophets, go and do the work I've told you, told you to do. Do it. <laughs> and it's just like they're shut down now. They're shut downs now or uh, restrictions, COVID-19 restrictions because PA. And by law, I, I read all the restrictions. It doesn't affect churches. It doesn't. So, but people will be like, oh man, we don't want to be, uh, we don't want to go against the government. No. Fear God rather than fear man. Especially when the law is on your side. It's just people don't understand it. So the law was on their side, if you know the story. And they just wrote a letter and said, hey, the first king, King Cyrus, he told us to go build a house. So we're on the right side to build a house. So be ready to you know, write a letter or face the music, but obey God, believe God. Amen? So how will this temple be greater than Solomon's temple? You ask yourself. Uh, think about it. Before the captivity, Solomon's temple was used for idols. I mean, they put the queen of heaven in there. They brought in idols in there. Um, and it was a desolate place at times because King Josiah, they opened their door of the house of the Lord. <laughs> I mean, it was locked up for a while. So no one was going in there. So Solomon's temple was... At, at many times, desolate, breaking down, they had to go build it again. Uh, so it's very easy for this new house to be great, uh, to be in, uh, to have greater glory than the former house. But I'll give you a couple of uh, reasons why, uh, or the Bible shows us that this later temple had greater glory. Number one, Jesus came into this later temple. And Jesus said, greater, a greater than Solomon is here. So even Solomon's temple in all his glory, Jesus entered this uh, second temple, and therefore is more glorified. I mean, <laughs> this is the temple Jesus entered, so... I mean, enough said. I don't have to say any more. But I'll give you another one. This temple lasted significantly longer. More people, more generations, more nations visited this temple. Because the former temple lasted for about 300 years. About 300 years from when they built it to the captivity. And this temple lasted from the captivity maybe uh, over 500 years before 70 AD. So this temple lasted way longer, so more generations, it was greater, and they had peace. They had peace longer with this temple. Over to Jeremiah chapter 16, Jeremiah 16 verse 10. And now, after that temple, after the temple was done with because of the New Testament, we even have a greater temple, which is yourself. You're looking at it. <laughs> You're looking at the temple of God. We are the temple of God. We are the house of God. The Holy Spirit lives in us, right? So we even have a greater temple. And uh, that shows God just things get better with the Lord. You say, oh, if this temple is destroyed, uh, would there be a, a, a greater temple? Yes, even much more better. Showing the power of God that God can be in all of us at the same time. And the same thing will happen. Uh, the, the same thing will happen in... The millennial reign. This temple will be gone, done away with and we'll have Jesus with us, right? And the new heaven and the new earth, 
the temple of God will come down and God will be with us again. So it just keeps getting better and better at the temple of God. All right, look at Jeremiah 16, verse 10. The Bible says, And it shall come to pass, when thou shalt shew these people all these words, and they shall say unto thee, Wherefore had the Lord pronounced all this great evil against us? Or what is our iniquity? Or what is our sin that we have committed against the Lord our God? So God is telling Jeremiah, it will come to pass, when you're telling them all this prophecy of negativity, that they're going to go into captivity, they're going to be destroyed as a nation, their land will lie desolate, they are going to ask you, how is this so? Like, why is this happening to us? <laughs> you know, it's funny, you're preaching people, oh, you're committing sin, you're living in sin, you're not obeying the word of God, and they're like, how? I mean, I go to church, I pay my tithes. <laughs> but do you think God wants to eat the flesh of bulls and the blood of goats? I mean, he wants you to be circumcised inside. God looks at the heart, right? Anyway, verse 11, then shall thou say unto them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, said the Lord, and have walked after other gods, and have served them, and have worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and have not kept my law. So, if you pause here, it looks as if God is punishing them for their father's sake. No, God is not punishing them for their father's sake. He's punishing them for their sake. God is pointing that out to teach us and to show us that he has been merciful for generations. Now, let's see where his mercy is getting. Let's see where his mercy is getting him. The next verse. And ye, that means he's talking to these people, this generation. And ye have done worse than your fathers. You see that? You put two and two together, what do you think the next generation will be? There will probably be left no more righteous person. And it's just by Sodom and Gomorrah. So God is going to cut his losses. Right? I'm just going to punish all of them so that the remnant can come again and I'll build them up again. So this is God being merciful <laughs> and trying to keep his word that a son of David would remain on the throne. So that's why God is sending them to captivity. He's not punishing them for their father's sake. He's just showing that I've been merciful to you guys. Look back. See how your fathers have been messing up and you're doing worse. So what do you think your children are going to do? You see what I mean? So that's what God is pointing out. Verse 12 again. And ye have done worse than your fathers. For behold, ye walk everyone after the imagination of his evil heart, that they may not hearken unto me. Therefore will I cast you out of this land, into a land that ye know not, ye know not, neither ye nor your fathers. And there shall ye serve other gods day and night, where, uh, where I will not shew you favor. Therefore, behold, the days come, said the Lord, that it shall no more be said, the Lord liveth, that brought brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from the lands whither he had driven them and I will bring them again into their land that I gave unto their fathers. So what is God saying? He's going to replace the wonders of Egypt with this. The, the nations, you know, anytime they think of Israel, anytime they think of the land of Israel, the people of God, they're like, oh, remember what God did, what God did in Egypt for these people. God took, destroyed the Egyptian nation, destroyed their whole armies, parted the Red Sea, put plagues in Egypt. The world remembers this. So, but these days, people will no more talk about the wonders of Egypt. They will now talk about how God rescued them from captivity, from the land of Babylon, from the northern land, and whither he scattered them. So that will surpass the wonders of Egypt. So if God is going to do that for, uh, for uh, setting them free from bondage and captivity, he's going to do the same with the temple. He's going to do the same temple. So the, the same God that built the first temple, same God that brought, took them out of Egypt, he said, taking you out of Babylon, out of the northern land, will be greater because that's what people will be talking about. That's what, uh, how, how great, I mean, the king just woke up one morning, spirit stirred, and said, go. <laughs> Gave them everything. Other nations will be wondering, like, what is going on? These people really have a God. It's so clear that it was God that was doing it. So the younger men in the days of Zerubbabel had more understanding than the ancients, thanks to the preaching of the word of God, the revelation of the word of God. Prophesied by Haggai, prophesied by 
Zechariah during that time. Open to Psalm 119, Psalm 119 verse 97. Psalm 119 verse 97. So, which is what I'm talking about, which is what this sermon is all about. During the times of the Bible, they were having more and more revelation. Ancient men were not necessarily wrong. They were not wrong. They were writing the assessments. They are writing, giving you advice. But understand that there is more revelation in the Word of God. And you can understand more than the ancients. Amen? All right. I'm still explaining. Let's keep going. Psalm 119, look at verse 97. The Bible. Psalm 11997, uh, verse 1, uh, sorry, verse 97. Oh, how love I thy law, it is my meditation all the day. So in these eight verses, because I do them eight verses at a go, in these eight verses, um, the psalmist is talking about the law of God throughout the Psalm 119, just about the laws, the laws of God. So I'm going to explain them verse by verse. So he said, Oh, how love I thy law, it is my meditation all the day. He didn't say some of the day, he said all the day. So the reading of the word of God is required of us. The thinking about the word of God, we should meditate on the word of God in our thoughts, everything you do. Because before you talk, at least we tell our children this, before you talk, think. Think about what you're going to say. Don't just, you know, say, oh, I want to say my mind. That's not a smart thing to do. You know, I'm just going to say my mind. Don't say your mind. Think first. <laughs> then say the right things. Because is, I think someone in the Proverbs says, the, the fool said all his mind, all his thoughts. You know, don't, don't say that. Think first. So think before you act. Think before you talk. Be slow to speak, quick to hear, as the Bible says. So if you're going to think, then make sure the word of God, you're weighing your options with the word of God, what you're going to say. You prove your words with the word of God. And the Bible says all day, because in Psalm, in Psalm 10 verse 4, the Bible says, the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. So all your thoughts, God is, you, it is required that God is in your thoughts. Now, how is God in your thoughts? By his word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So if you, you're thinking about the word of God all the day, then God is in your thoughts all the day. So the psalmist says, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Verse 98. Thou through thy commandment has made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. So if you're following the commandments of God, because you love the laws of God, your, your, the words of God and your thoughts all the day, you're following the commandments of God, yes, you have enemies, right? You might have enemies, most likely have enemies because many people don't follow the word of God. But more importantly, those enemies are not following the word of God. Because if they are following the word of God, they wouldn't be your enemies. Right? They'll be allies, they'll be your friends, they'll support you. <laughs> but because they're not following the word of God, they're your enemies. So guess who's going to be wiser? You. Because the wisdom of God is, or I should say, the foolishness of God, as the Bible says, is wiser than men. So no matter how much they craft or try to pull you down, you're going to come out wiser. Now, it's not just wisdom you need. Read Proverbs. I mean, you need to <laughs> work hard and uh, have, you know, be comfortable. Because if you're wise and poor, people despise you. Anyway. So, but the wisdom of God is, uh, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And uh, since you have the word of God, you're going to be wiser than your enemies. That's what the Bible says. And these enemies are not necessarily the haters of God. Open to Psalm 55, Psalm 55, verse 12. They are not necessarily the haters of God because you say, oh, my enemies hate God. So, no, they're not God's enemies. It says your enemies. You'll be wiser than your enemies. They are most likely believers. In fact, I believe in context, he's talking about believers. That I'm wiser than my enemies. Uh, why, why do I think so? Because he says, for they are forever with me. Right? Now, it could also mean his enemies around him, the nations around him. But it could, for our own day, uh, our own time, uh, it could be a family member, even a church member, and it could be neighbors or colleagues, because they are forever around you. Right? So that's how you want to look at it. In Psalm 55 verse 12, this is what David said. For it was not an enemy that reproached me, then I could have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me, that did magnify himself against me, then I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou, a man mine equal, my guide, my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel to 
together and walked into the house of God in company. Who do you think David was talking about here? I believe it was during the time of the uh, Absalom, when Absalom wanted to overthrow King David. And the main person I believe he's talking about is Ahithophel. Ahithophel was his friend, his counselor, his, a, a man, his equal, and they walked into the house of God together, and he backstabbed, Ahithophel backstabbed David by uh, joining Absalom. Anyway, so, but David came out the smarter, right? David came out with all his plans, how to save himself, basically, although he was still trying to save his son. But David came out smarter. So who was he dealing with? His enemies, but he loved them. But he was wiser than them. Why? Because he had the word of God with him. So he knew the promises of God concerning his life. And, you know, he came out wiser than Ahithophel, no matter how smart Ahithophel was. So that's one instance. Maybe somebody else, I think, is Ahithophel. Um, let's keep reading. Verse 99, Psalm 109, sorry, 119, verse 99. I have more understanding than my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep thy precepts. Obviously, this is where I got the, the topic from, understanding more than the ancients. Why? Because the testimonies of God, the word of God are always your meditation. Because you keep the precepts of God. You're walking, you're putting the word of God as a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Hey, you will have more understanding because the word of this, more revelation. The psalmist says, open my, uh, God, uh, open my eyes and I may behold marvelous things from thy word. Because he wants to be, the, the word of God is new every day. They are spirit and they are life. So we, we grow more and more in the word of God. Now, this is especially during the time of the writing of the Bible. Because during the time of writing the Bible, there was more revelation and more revelation given to the people uh, in the days of the, that the Bible was written. So when the Bible was written, there was so much more revelation. Uh, I'll give you an example. Open to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. As you open there, I'll read you 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7. This is about Paul. Many doctrines, revelations were given to Paul. And Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So God was revealing a lot of things to Paul. And in order to keep Paul in check so that his pride doesn't get to him, God gave him a thorn in the flesh. So, I mean, God, like, is... You say that's vaccination, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and, <laughs> that's to prevent him from sinning, right? God like, took measures uh, <laughs> in his hand to prevent Paul because God wanted to use Paul. And Paul said, you know, use me. I'll, I'll gladly spend and be spent for you. you know, Paul was willing and God used him. And God put that phone in flesh and said, my grace is sufficient for you. But he was giving him revelations. Let me show you what I mean. You're there in Galatians. Look at verse 6. Popular passage. I want to point out something at the end there. Galatians verse six, uh, chapter 1, verse 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ, unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which, ye, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For, I do, uh, for do I now persuade men, or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Verse 11. But I certify, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, this is where people go, you know, take it too far, take it to an extreme, and say, you know, Paul had his own gospel, and Jesus had his own gospel, and Abraham had his own gospel, you know, all these different gospels. So they just twist this Bible verse and they, they misconstrue it. Paul clearly said that there's only one gospel, like in the passage leading to it. This is the gospel I'm preaching to you. And if anybody comes to you, comes to you with another gospel, let him be accursed. Next, thing, Paul is saying, oh, my gospel is different. I mean, <laughs> It does not make sense. What he's saying is that I have more revelation. More revelation about it. Because the, people, the Jews probably thought the gospel was just for only them. 
you know, oh, the gospel is just for only me. So he was out there preaching to Gentiles. This is more revelation that Jesus was trying to, I, he gave Peter. Remember when Peter was on the roof and he had a vision and Jesus was trying to show him anything I call clean, don't call it unclean. And, you know, Peter was like, oh, I'll still go to Cornelius. But, you know, Peter, throughout his life, he was still on the fence. I don't say on the fence, but he was not as motivated as Paul. So God just went to Paul and said, I give him all this revelation, all the mystery of the Gentiles, mystery of this, a whole lot of doctrines. And Paul taught us a lot. He wrote many books in the New Testament. More revelation. It is not different from the Old Testament. It is more revelation. You see what I mean? So Paul had more understanding than his teachers. He had more understanding than the ancients. Because they were Jews. They were Pharisees that were even saved. But Paul had more understanding than them. You see that? He was not yet you know, a full-fledged, you know, top Pharisee before he got saved. So there were all these higher guys above him, but he had more understanding than them. Now, other examples. Let's go back. Daniel. In the days of Daniel, uh, Daniel did not understand as much as we understand now. Because we have more revelation in the Word of God. You know, Daniel, he was lost. <laughs> He's like, I don't, I, I don't understand these things. And the, the angel told him, don't worry, Daniel. <laughs> it's not for your time. I was just giving you too much information. It's just <laughs> TMI right here. So uh, don't worry, go. Just stay, rest in your own time. When that time comes, you take your place with the resurrected. You know? So Daniel did not understand. And that's why when we're explaining the end times, we go to Revelation. We just show you in Daniel so you can see that God God knew these things before time. God prophesied these things before time. And with the revelations, I mean the word revelation, more things revealed. With the revelation, you can see, uh, you can understand Daniel more. So you use the, the latter part of the Bible explains the former. Right? So, and Bible, even God said that the end of something is better than the beginning. Amen? So, Daniel is another example. And this example here with the ancient men in the days of Ezra. The ancient men, they saw this temple, and they're like, this temple is nothing compared to the former temple. This new temple, just starting off with the foundation. Remember the new temple, how it, the former temple, how it was built? There was no noise in the building site. Not one noise. Everything, all the stones, every, every craft was done outside in another area. And when they were all built up, they came, it was just assembly, right? They assembled everything on site. There was no heating, no noise, not. So them just seeing this temple, the foundation being laid, like this temple is not even going to match the former temple. But there was more revelation. God said, I'm going to make the glory of this temple greater than the glory of the former. Now, this does not mean in any way that we are more superior, or I should say we are superior to the ancients, or we are superior to our teachers, or, even, or we are superior to our enemies. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying we have more understanding. Well, if you're thinking of superiority, oh yeah, because we're in this latter generation, we're superior. That is called Jew mentality. Oh, because we have the word of God and we are more, we're superior to these guys. You know, that is a Jewish mentality. So don't don't have that mentality. It just means that in the times we are living, that it we have more understanding. And don't think that we are we are the wisest people. Oh, we're the best people. Even uh, the wisest men. The, the wisest scientists of this day, they are probably not as wise as these people of the, other, of the olden days, of the past days. It's just that God has revealed more to us. I'm saying, that's what I'm trying to tell you. It's from the Word of God. God is the one revealing to us. And the things that He has revealed, fine, it's for us to keep. The ones that He hasn't revealed, it belongs to Him. So the more He reveals, the more that is given to us, the more that is expected of us. To whom much is given, much is required. So God is requiring much more from us. Amen. So that this is actually a lesson for us, a challenge for us. Solomon was more than a scientist. Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived, right? Not counting Jesus. According to the Bible, there was no other wise king that ever lived as Solomon. So Solomon, was, he was wiser than science. I mean, he knew natural things, spiritual things, everything. And what did Solomon say at the end in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 12? And further, you don't have to open there, and further by these, my son, be admonished. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. You say, oh, I want to be wise. I want to know more and more and more. No, just go to the Word of God. Let God reveal you the things that He wants you to do. Because after that verse, it says, and hear the conclusion of this matter. Fear God and obey His commandments. This is the whole duty of man, right? So fear God and obey the commandments of God. 
So what does it mean? It means that there is always more revelation in the Word of God. Never think you've exhausted the Bible. Oh, I've read the Bible ten times. I've read it. This is my seventh time. It's not like I'm going to be a pastor. So then you start slacking in your reading of the Bible. There is more revelation. There is more understanding. Continue to read your Bible. Right? Coming, going to uh, entering a new year. If you haven't been reading your Bible, start making plans to read your Bible. In fact, start reading your Bible now. <laughs> hey, it doesn't hurt. Start from Genesis chapter 1. You, you know, get a head start before the new year. So start making plans to read your Bible because there's new, there are always revelation. The Bible, the words of God, their spirit and their life. Don't be held back and be as the ancient men and say, oh, I have everything, I, or you think you know everything. Then you, a new generation will come up, people, and God will reveal more things. God can reveal more things to you that will help your life, that will help you to build his house, that will help you to understand that uh, the silver and gold is his, that he can do anything, that you should not be afraid of the times that you're living in, of the government or people stopping you from serving the Lord. Because they were trying to stop them from building the house of God at the time. So, at 2020, if 2021 is anything like 2020, <laughs> then you really need more revelation. <laughs> Let me just put it that way. Because myself too, I'm not just talking, I'm talking to myself too. I mean, see how I handled the COVID-19. Hindsight is 2020, right? What do you know? Hindsight is 2020. <laughs> no pun intended. So, looking back, I would have handled it a whole lot different. You know, I need more understanding. I need more revelation. I need to understand the word of God more and more. So start read, continue reading your Bible. Amen? So that you can flow with the times. If not, you'll be left back. When, when we preach something, or, or when uh, uh, the church is going in a direction, and you know, oh, I don't support this direction. Have you been reading your Bible? You're still stuck in the, in the old, old times, in the 2020s, right? You're still stuck in the ancient man days. There's new revelation, where we can actually go against the king, where you can actually serve God without fear. Looking even the nations around you, uh, uh, surrounding you, without fearing them and serving the Lord. So it means that we should read the Bible and continue to ask God to open our eyes so that we can behold the revelations in the word of God. All right, let's move on. Verse 101, Psalm 119, verse 101. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. Simple. Abstain from every appearance of evil. Abstain yourself. Let's flee. Go away. Don't stay. If you know there's evil, leave that place. Don't be associated with it. I mean, we pray, or Jesus taught us to pray, lead us not into temptation. Now, why would you intentionally go into temptation? Why would you just find evil and go there? You know? So, um, abstain from the appearance of evil. And that means you need to understand your flesh. Understand the flesh. Don't, because uh, if you're the type, in fact, yes, I'm the type, I'm not moved by alcohol. It doesn't, I, it doesn't move me at all. In fact, it disgusts me. So, I can walk into a bar and I'll be fine. But does it mean I even want to walk into a bar? Do you think it's only alcohol that is dangerous in a bar? Okay, exactly. So it's not only alcohol. So I still have abstain from the appearance of you because I know my flesh. <laughs> right? I know my own weak points and I just know the flesh in general. So abstain from the appearance of you. I don't think, oh, he that think that he standeth, take heed lest he falls. Amen? So the, the psalmist says, I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I have not departed, verse 102, I have not departed from thy judgment, thou hast taught me. How will you not depart from the judgment of God? For us now, be led by the, the Spirit of God. Those that are led by the uh, Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, right? Jesus was led by the Spirit of God. He was led by the Spirit even into the wilderness. He was led by the Spirit to be tempted. He was led by, I mean, he was filled with the Spirit without measure. So learn from that. Uh, uh, be led by the Spirit of God. That means following the words of God because it's in your meditate. You meditate on it all day, right? As the Bible says. And you get to a point where you already know what to do when you come, to, uh, come you face any situation, any circumstance. No matter how, what the consequence, consequences are, you tell the truth. No deception, right? Because you are led by the Spirit of God. The Spirit will never lead you to sin. What is sin? The transgression of the law. The Spirit, why, why am I saying this? Because someone can pray and pray and pray and say, you know, the Spirit leads me to divorce. You know, I, I have to divorce at this time, you know, and go and remarry. You know, I have to divorce and remarry. The Spirit is leading. That's not the Spirit. Okay? Now, this is more of, from where my, my background really is, this is more of Pentecostal, charismatic. Everything is the Word 
of faith. Oh, the, the Spirit is saying this. The Spirit is saying that. That is not being led by the Spirit of God. The Spirit will not go against the Word of God. He'll remind you of the things that I have said. That is Jesus speaking. Things that I have said. So, should we not lead you into deception for the greater good? Or let me deceive this person, but, you know, it's for the greater good. That's not the Spirit of God leading you. And the Spirit will not lead you to choose the lesser evil. Okay? <laughs> That's not the Spirit of God. So, don't say you were led by the Spirit of God to do this. All right, let's move on. Verse 103. Psalm 119, 103. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. This does not happen overnight. For the word of God to be sweet unto you, it's not like you just get saved all of a sudden. Wow, it's so sweet. Now, if you start reading your Bible right now, <laughs> like if you've not been reading your Bible, start reading your Bible right now, it will be marvelous. You'll be wondering to yourself, why wasn't I doing this every day? You know, then as time goes on, it starts to wane. <laughs> Everyone has been there, that's right, okay? So I tell you that's the way. You have to revive yourself, like you have to revitalize yourself somehow. I mean, you keep keep at it. You know, keep at it because that, that is the test. You know, for example, you start fasting and you're like, Yeah, I'm feeling good. You know, you read your Bible, you're praying. As time goes on, you're like, ah, oh. you slow down. But you just keep at it and it will be good for you. The best example for this is overcoming sugar. If anyone has ever tried that. When you start overcoming sugar, at a certain point, it's like, it's, a, it's, a, it's addictive. <laughs> you find out how people are cocaine, <laughs> how they feel when they are trying to overcome cocaine, I guess. So, but at a certain point though, you get to a point where you dislike sugar. It happened. It happened to me. You can drink juice. Because before every meal was with juice. Literally, every meal. Water was like, there's no juice. You need to buy juice. All right, give me water. You know, water was like, I'm choking. Just let me drink. Yeah. <laughs> every meal was juice. You know, I was young then, so fortunately for me. Uh, so, but then we stopped juice, no more juice, and we reduced sugar, uh, no cereal, things like that. After a while, if I drink juice, even the juice in the fridge right now, if I drink it raw like that, I say raw, but <laughs> exactly. If I drink it like that, it's like it's too sweet. So in my house, or in my house, yeah, eat, for the holidays, we have, you know, we bring out juice, right? Because it's pleasure, and the kids are all happy. Because water is the staple drink, okay? So, but parties and stuff, and you know, celebrations, you know, we bring out the juice, and they are also happy. Anyway, but we mix it with water because it's too sweet. <laughs> this was me that I could just drink juice like a whole like the bottle and that's it. But I had to mix it with water because it's too sweet. Why? Because it's now you don't like sugar anymore. What I'm trying to say here is but you're reading Leviticus, you're reading Ezekiel. <laughs> Those are the hard ones. You know, I tell my kids to finish their Bible. What books have you not read? Uh, we haven't read Ezekiel. <laughs> I don't blame them. They're reading. They don't understand what they are reading most of the time. <laughs> anyway, so you're reading Ezekiel. You're reading all these hard books in the Bible. It's hard to go on. It's just hard to go on. But just keep doing it. At a certain point, the Bible will be sweet to you because you've been reading it. And without going, without reading your Bible, it's like it's horrible. You read other books and they don't match the Bible. So this is where the psalmist has gotten to, where the words of God are sweet to his taste. They're sweet to his taste, yes, sweeter than honey to his mouth. So the word of God is that sweet. And we want to get to that point where, yes, we're sinners. You know, we're, we're going to live in, uh, we're going to commit sin. But we should not live as sinners. We should not commit, like, our, we should not have a sinful way of life. You know, don't commit presumptuous sins. You know, uh, I, I use that relation with the sugar example. Yet it's not as if I don't take sugar at all. I take sugar, but, you know, not as much. Amen. All right, last verse here in Psalm 119 is verse 104. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Open to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7. So, through thy precepts I get understanding. Remember, we're talking about understanding more than the ancients. So, David, he had uh, ancient, like the older ones teach him, he had teachers, he had counselors. And, but he's always in the Word of God, always reading the Word of God. And he's getting more and more understanding. The Holy Spirit was with him. I mean, David wrote part of the Bible himself, so he was getting revelations of the Word of God. So, we have the complete Bible with us. 
So it's not like we're waiting for more revelation of the word of God. We're not waiting. We're waiting for the second coming of Christ, right? So we have the complete Bible. What is the thing we're missing? Understanding. That is what we're missing. The Bible says in Proverbs 4 verse 7, Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. That is very important. Everyone focuses on wisdom. Oh yeah, just you know, get wisdom, get wisdom. Yes, it's a principal thing. I'm, I'm not saying you know it's not. No, don't get wisdom. But get understanding. Understanding. Because the, the men of Issachar, these were, these were men that had understanding of the times. They were, it, it's, it's, <laughs> you need it with wisdom so that you can live. You need understanding. Understanding is that important. So, we need understanding so that we can apply the word of God in our lives today. Because, understand this, there is nothing new under the sun. You say, oh, but cars were not there. You see, you don't have understanding. <laughs> it's as simple as that. <laughs> you don't have understanding. Because you're thinking, oh, there's something new under the sun. So, you think the Bible is wrong? Oh, the Bible tells you there's nothing new under the sun. What has been will always be, and what will be has already been. That's what the Bible says. So you need to get understanding to know how the car applies to your life. Right? Um, or any other thing. I just thought of car. But any other thing, uh, thing applies to your life. So we need understanding for the day we're living in now and for the days that are coming ahead. So understand. We have more understanding than the ancient because we have the word of God. Because of thy precepts. And why would you hate every false way? Open to Psalm 73. Psalm 73. When you have understanding, you will hate every false way. Right? You will hate choosing the lesser evil. <laughs> right? You, you will hate every false way because you have understanding. Uh, under, when you have understanding, you know the end of something before the beginning. Why? Because the Alpha and the Omega is here. He's Alpha and the Omega. He's showing you the end. He tells you how things will end. So since you already know the end from the beginning, you know the end of a child in public school. You know the end. The Bible says, uh, evil communication corrupt good manners. Right? So unless your child is the worst child in that class or in that whole school, then nothing will happen to your child. Right? Because <laughs> everybody balances the best child and the worst child. They're all corrupted, right? So somebody's going to corrupt your child. It's as simple as that. Don't be deceived. <laughs> so you know the end from the beginning already. Uh, the Bible tells us in Psalm 73, that's why you hate every false way, right? The Bible tells us in Psalm 73, verse 12, Behold, these are ungodly. We're talking about the wicked people that are uh, prospering in this world. Since behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world, they increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been played and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then on understood I their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places, thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment they are utterly consumed with terrors. I mean you can go on and on and on. So the point I'm trying to uh, point out is that there are some people prospering, right? Especially in these times, in these COVID-19 times. The, the government is supposedly to help the middle class or the guys struggling. Guess who they are helping? Amazon. Who are they helping? Walmart. Who are they helping? The rich people. I mean, they are, the, the rich, they are just multiplying wealth. I mean, nobody is going to buy from mom and pop store anymore. Everybody is just buying everything online. Look at this Christmas holiday. They shut everything down. Why? Because they want Amazon to make money. See, I don't want to go into politics, but <laughs> these are, the other ones voting. For, for this, they like it, they want it, uh, they are voting for it. Anyway, but my point is, you look at it and you're like, why am I, why am I wasting my time? Why am I suffering? Why am I? Should I just give up? It's painful to know all this. Is. But how would you 
live through this. How would you continue to obey God and do the right thing? It's when you go to church. When you went to the sanctuary of God, what do you think happens in the sanctuary? That's the reading of the word of God, right? The reading of the word of God. Then he understood their end. Even when you sing in the word, uh, what were they singing? The Psalms. I mean, read this. It's the psalm I read it. <laughs> read the psalms, and you understand the end, the end of these people. You understand things, marvelous things, things in the Word of God. The psalms put it in a poetic way. So, you read and you understand, then you can go on. You see that? So we need understanding for the day and age that we live in. And what are these false ways that you will hate? False religion. Every false religion is a false way. Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. No man comment to the Father except by him. So false religion, covetous practices. These are false ways. Because God hates covetousness. They are like idolatry, right? Deception. Any form of deception. Whether it's lies, false witness. And these are all false ways. You know, pride. False ways. You will hate it. That's what the Bible says. You, you are bored. You hate it. You don't want to be part of it. So, uh, let me conclude. As we remember the birth of Christ. You know, this day and age, I, I, people don't understand what Christmas is all about. They don't remember what Christmas is all about. In fact, the word Christ is in Christmas. And what does Christ mean? It doesn't just mean Jesus. It means Messiah. Right? I mean, Jesus is Messiah, I know. But it should be pointing out Messiah. So everybody or the world celebrates everything other than the Messiah. Oh, but, but we give gifts. Is that not celebrating Jesus? <laughs> yeah, that's the closest to celebrating Christ. We give gifts. So it, it's amazing. Uh, people forget that we are remembering the birth of Christ and the significance of the birth of Christ. But they forget it. And um, it's sad. But as we remember the birth of Christ, we understand how the prophecies of the Old Testament are possible. That's the more revelation we, we, got, uh, we have here with the Word of God. Not just how they are possible, their significance also. I mean, when they were prophesying these things, uh, first of all, how is it possible? They knew it to happen, but they just didn't have more revelation on it. But they knew it to happen. But how does this come together? How will it even happen? And how will it, what is the significance of it? So with the more revelation we have, we understand that Jesus is both God and man. Equally, at the same time. Not half God, half man. <laughs> you know? You're like, how, how is this, like, what's going to happen? Yeah, he's both God and man. It's hard to understand, but it's a revelation that we've gotten. You know? Uh, the, the fact that Jesus living on the earth, you know, he came, he's living as man on the earth, and tempted in every way possible, yet without sin, obviously. But tempted in every way possible. What is the significance of that? You know, he's showing us how to live our lives. He's an example. And he's showing us that he understands us as man. When God says, I understand that man is flesh, you know, man would do the. Jesus understands the, the temptations we're going through. He understands it. So that's something that's to help us in the day and age we're living. You say, oh, but Jesus wasn't tempted with this or with that. There's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing. So he was tempted with that. <laughs> so you can overcome it. There's no temptation that, that, that comes your way that you can overcome. I'm paraphrasing it. But God gives us a way of escape for every temptation. So if, it's, if it has come to you, then God believes you can overcome it. If you cannot, he will stop that temptation from co coming your way. So that's not an excuse. And the timing of his birth also. Why didn't he come in the time of Instagram, right? <laughs> or what's out there? Palo or something? I don't know. There are new things coming out every time. So why didn't he come in the time of Instagram? Where we see his face and all. There's, a, there's significances for all these things. Read your Bible. Understand why Jesus did all these things. And understand the times that we live in now. And look at the New Testament. The New Revelation, the New Testament. So we have more understanding than the ancients, right? But I'll put it this way. It's like the instructions of parents to growing children. Not to adults, I mean to growing children. The older they get, the more they understand, right? I tell my kids the same things over and over again. As they get older, they're understanding. The same thing I'm telling them, they're understanding it more and more and more, right? So the older they get. Now, the growing children in, in this instance are generations. So 
So one generation has uh, this revelation, another generation, more revelation, with it, because of the times they are living in. They see, oh wow, the word of God applies in this our generation with these things, because there's nothing new under the sun. Oh, the word of God applies in this generation, in this, so they're getting more revelation about the same word of God for their own time, as revealed by God unto them. You see what I mean? Over to Proverbs chapter 30, verse 11. Proverbs 30, verse 11. Now, the extreme of this is that a generation will think that they are too wise. A generation will think that they are better than the older generations. I already said that earlier. That's not what I'm preaching here. I'm not saying, oh, we're better than the older generations. Oh, we're better than, you know, the jackals and all of them. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> it's our times. What, we're, what has been revealed to us, we have more understanding to apply to the times that we're living in. We understand the times that they lived in, the, uh, the understanding for the times that they live in. We need more understanding for the times we are living in. That's why we need to continue reading the Word of God. But don't go to the extreme and say, oh yeah, we're, we're better than them and we're, you know, we're too good. The Bible warns us that in Proverbs 30 verse 11, there is a generation that cursed their father and doth not bless their mother. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. There is a generation, oh how lofty their eyes and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor, the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. Just think back. <laughs> No, you don't have to think too much. But just read that again. Is that not 2020? Cossette father and does not bless mother. I mean, that's been going on even before 2020. A generation that are pure in their own eyes. They, they think only their ways are right. Oh, the other, the older generations were all racist and America was built on racism and all that. They just think they're the best people on earth, right? And they're way better than the other generation. Or they're so lofty with their eyes. You know, we're, we're going to, what did Trump uh, release? He started off a, a, a branch of the army, a branch of the military to, uh, for space. I, I don't know who they're fighting in space. But, <laughs> No, but I'm serious. Go look it up. I mean, they're so lofty with their eyes, you know. We're going to reach heights. We're going to have military in space. That's where your tax dollars are going into. No, I'm serious. Having said that, though, there's some crazy guy in Israel that said they're aliens and stuff. And go look it up if you think I'm lying. It's public news that they found aliens. America has known about aliens for a long time. That's why Trump started this tax force for military in space and all that. Anyway, that was just in my head. But what I'm trying to say is they are loved with their eyes. They want, oh, you know what? We're going to go to zero emissions, no carbon, anything. We're just going to run off of sunlight or something like that. So just great things. Just think over more than they can reach. Then there's a generation whose teeth are swords. Have you heard of cancel culture? They just want to destroy anybody. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to make cake for your sodomite wedding and draw two men. And yeah, I'm not going to do all that. You can take any cake in my store, but I'm not going to make a cake and draw that for you. Oh, that means your store must close down. You see, just want to destroy people. That's, that's a generation. Uh, anybody that doesn't do, do what you like, cancel him. He, don't buy his stuff. Don't go, you know. <laughs> the day might come when they'll, in fact, let me not say that. I don't, <laughs> don't say anything. But there are people that pastors preaching and they cancel them. They, their jobs fired them or they had to leave their jobs. It's sad. So, because they don't like what the person is saying. It's, it's amazing. And that's the generation we're living in. It's very sad. That's not what I'm pushing for. And that's the extreme. When you go to the extreme and say, oh yeah, we have more understanding. We're better than these people. These people are so wrong. No. I'm just saying we have more understanding. They had understanding of the word of God. We have more understanding for the times that we're living in. And we should get more understanding. You should read the Bible. Don't just go on with, oh, what that pastor preached 60 years ago. That's what I'm going with. Oh, that's what is still right. That was for his time. Amen. So read your Bible, understand what God is teaching us for our times. Now, every parent wants their children to be greater. At least that's what I want. I want my children to be greater than me. I want them to understand the Bible more than I understand the Bible. I want them to have more revelation than I have. So uh, even Jesus said that precedence, right? Jesus said in, in the way he could, I'm not saying we're greater than Jesus, but in the way he could, that means greater works. He said in John 14, 12, 
very, very, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these, because I go to my Father. If Jesus stayed, he would have even done so much more. But he's going to his Father, so we had to do all these works, and it's going to be greater works. I'm going to do so much more. He says, the works I do, I mean, you can't, what is greater than raising someone from the dead? Yes, disciples did it, but, I mean, what else is greater than that? But, uh, yeah, greater works. So God is setting precedence that the next generation, the next batch should do great things for God, greater things for the Lord, right? So, and to do great things for the Lord, you need understanding for the times that you're living in. So every parent should want to lay the foundation, lay the foundation for your children. Start teaching them the Bible, reading the Bible to them so that they can grow from what, from your level. Don't make them start from where you started. Let them continue from where you stopped. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I want to teach them everything I know and tell them there's still much more to learn. There's still much more to learn from the Bible. Read the Bible and learn more than I know. So that is what you want to teach them. The psalmist David there, he had teachers. I'm not saying we should not have teachers. Oh, we have more understanding than the ancients. We know more than our teachers. So don't listen to anybody. Don't come to church. No, just read the Bible and get on. That's not what I'm saying. The psalmist had teachers. He had counselors. He just had more understanding. David also, at the time, the Bible was being written. He was being, the word of God was revealed unto him. So we look at it this way. The law is our schoolmaster, right? Read your Bible. Read your Bible, read it a couple times, then study it, get understanding. Amen? So start off. Don't go against the law. You say, oh no, I'm not following the law, you know, I'm under the law to Christ, then you go against the law. No, don't go against the law. Yes, we have to be led by the Spirit of God. But there are some clear things written in the law. You know, don't go against it. The Bible talks about alcohol, what, what alcohol does. The Bible talks about different things. Don't go against it and think you're smart. Oh, I have more understanding, I'm following the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will not lead you to sin. Sin is to transgress the law. So start off. I'm doing the law of God, right? Then you can grow from there. See how it applies to the day and age that we live in. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us about the understanding that we can get from your word. More revelation because your word can never be exhausted. There's manifold wisdom in there. I pray, oh Lord, that you help us to understand your word. Open our eyes as we read your word so that we can understand, uh, first of all, the times that we're living in, how your word applies to the times that we're living in. Continue to give us this grace, oh Lord, and help us to desire and have zeal for your word in Jesus' name. Continue to bless our church, oh Lord, as we go so winning. Help us uh, so that we can win souls so we can come back rejoicing and um, bless everyone here Lord in Jesus name I pray. Amen.